being here. We're going to get started. Um, so welcome to the third session of the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing, third ECHO series. This series will have a focus on health equity. Whether you've been involved in previous ECHO sessions or are new to the space, we're so excited to be back and hope this interactive learning series is a place for you to find guidance and support. This program is brought to you by the National Commission <clears throat> to Address Racism in Nursing, a multi-organizational collaborative of leading nursing organizations examining the issue of racism within nursing and motivating all nurses to confront systemic racism. Next slide. This is an eight part series. You will earn 1.5 continuing nursing education credits for attending today's session. Please stay to the end to complete your evaluation and receive the CNE certificate. Today's topic is how do equity minded nurses advance anti racism. So quickly we're just going to go over our ground rules for the session. This is a brave space. Discussing racism and health equity is difficult and uncomfortable, especially for those directly impacted. Discussions such as these can serve as a trigger. We ask that you maintain respect for everyone joining us today. Please stay on mute until it is your turn to speak. Listen intently and respond thoughtfully. Be present, limit background distractions and multitasking. We encourage you to take advantage of the virtual features available in Zoom. We encourage turning your cameras on and using the chat box or the raise your hand features to communicate with the group, but please remember to mute your microphone when others are speaking. Please respect participant privacy. Do not disclose names or other sensitive information shared. If you share a scenario involving a patient, do not provide any PHI during today's call or any of the ECHO sessions. Um, feel free to send a direct message to ANA ECHO if you have any technical issues during today's call. And now I'm going to turn this presentation over to Dr. Piri Ackerman Barger. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I just need permission to be able to share screen. There we go. Um, could you, let's see, who can I see on my screen at the moment? I can see Tony Armstrong. Can you see my screen? Just give me a yes, thumbs up. Or... Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's fun noticing in the chat room that there are people from all over joining the chat um, and the uh, webinar today. So I'm really excited to work with all of you. <clears throat> We did introductions already, so I'll just quickly go past this slide. Only thing that I can add to the introduction is that I use she, her pronouns. So ultimately, what I want to do is talk with you about what it means to be an equity-minded nurse and how that relates to anti-racism. Just to make sure that we are using the same language, I just want to review the term health equity and what it is that we're trying to accomplish with health equity. This is a quote from scholars such as Paula Braveman in a blog that really resonates. They said that health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Um, they go on to say that this requires moving obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences like powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and healthcare. So that last sentence is really getting at what we've been calling the social determinants of health. And when those things are not equitably accessible among groups of people, we have something called health inequities. Another definition, not to compare, but rather to see additional nuances, is a quote from Kamara Jones. And she says something very similar. She says, health equity is the assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. And I bolded that. I want to highlight it and underline it. This means 
for all people. And um, this is really my argument for people that say all lives matter. And if you say all lives matter, then I know that health equity in all of its forms are important to you because we're talking about health outcomes for all of our people. Kamara Jones goes on to say that achieving health equity requires valuing all individuals and populations equally and recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. And this is a particular nuance that I think that we should spend a moment on. I know that it would be very convenient for each of us to wake up every morning and be able to start over with a clean slate. All of the mistakes we made yesterday, the day before, years in the past would just be erased and we could start afresh each day. That would be fabulous. Um, but that is magical thinking, to say the least. The things that we have done in our past do impact our outcomes today. And that's true for us as individuals. And that's true for us as a country. So we know that the policies, the procedures, the laws, all of those things that were created historically still impact our outcomes today. And so if we are going to figure out how to chart a path to a place that we haven't been before, this place called health equity, it's important for us to understand how our past has framed our present, what's happening in the present so that we can chart a path to the future that we want. Kamara Jones also says that part of health equity is providing resources according to need and that health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. So let's just take a moment to make sure that we understand the difference between health equity, health inequities, and health disparities. So health disparities is a measurement that determines if a health outcome is seen to a greater or lesser degree between populations, groups, and communities. And it's for us to determine then how much of a difference is acceptable. And so let's look at a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> A health disparity is that individuals experiencing homelessness have an average lifespan that's about 17 and a half years shorter than the general population. And I added a citation there. Um, <clears throat> another aspect of this to think about though, is that people from Hawaiian, Native American and African American descent are more likely to experience homelessness. So who, is carrying the burden of the loss of 17.5 years more than other groups are, right? So there's a racialized piece of this particular health disparity. So what do we do about things like this? Well, one of the things that I am going to propose is that we look into a framework called equity-minded nurses. And there's a blog that I wrote that is cited here. You can find it on the Campaign for Action website that goes into the definition and the why of equity-minded nurses. But for your learning convenience, I will go over some of the main tenets of being equity-minded. So the first one is that equity-minded healthcare professionals are those with the knowledge, skill, and desire to advance health equity. So there's a couple of things to point out here. One is that we need to be training our future nurses to be equity-minded. So we want equity-minded nursing graduates. For those of us who have been in nursing for a while, it's very likely that you never had a course on social determinants of health or uh, even heard the term equity, health equity when you were in nursing school. And so it becomes part of our own responsibility to get caught up on that notion. We know that this is something that is being called for uh, across healthcare sectors in the Future of Nursing Report 2021. Um, they talked about the important role that nurses have in advancing health equity. So there needs to be knowledge of what health, health equity is, the social determinants, um, their consequences, what health disparities are. It's fundamental for people to know that we can study health disparities, we can collect the data, 
we can educate people about health disparities, but none of those things actually change health outcomes. So the next piece is the action piece. What are the skills that we need? And we also need people to be motivated to make changes. So the second piece of it is that equity-minded healthcare professionals recognize themselves as informed and capable drivers of change who are uniquely poised to inform healthcare practice, policies, research, and educational standards. So one of the reasons that I added this in here is the amount of times that I've had conversations with nurses at all levels, um, including nursing students, who say, Dr. Peary, this information is interesting, but what does it have to do with me? I am busy taking care of patients at the bedside. And that just, you know, is something that gives me shivers of fear that um, our, our nursing workforce doesn't see themselves as central to. So one, yes, moving beyond just nursing being um, a task-driven workforce, but rather people who, again, have the skills, the knowledge, and desire to make change. When I talk with students and I ask them, how do we make change? They'll often say they should. They should write policies. And I ask, well, who are they? Politicians, legislators, lawmakers. And then I ask, well, where would those recommendations come from? Do you want the politicians writing out um, health care policy and procedure, or do you think that that should be coming from the professionals that are having contact with patients on a daily basis, who have the education, the evidence-based knowledge to design policy? And um, I think that one of the things that happens in our minds is that in a sort of, again, magical thinking, hopeful world, we want there to be a they, right? The capital T they is that group of people who are going to do these things. But we need to shift from a they mindset to a we mindset. There is no they. The they is we. And so each and every one of us has a role to play in making the recommendations that need to happen so that we can promote um, health equity. The third one. Equity-minded healthcare professionals so deeply understand and embrace health equity and social justice that these concepts emerge as normalized, automatic, and default thought process, no matter the setting or the group of people they work with. So what I'm suggesting here is that this is the opposite of unconscious bias. This is where rather than defaulting to the negative stereotypes we know about, we've learned about people over, you know, the, the years that we have been consuming television, movies, social media, all those things, that that isn't the default. The default becomes equity-mindedness, where we are looking for any opportunity to connect, to understand, and to potentially advocate for communities. So for a moment, moving from the notion of the big picture of health equity for all, we need to understand particular aspects of inequity. So I want to talk about inequities, but what I'm going to do is focus for a moment on racism specifically. And so one way for us to think about racism is that there are multiple layers and components of it. We have heard the term systemic racism many, many times over the last three years in the wake of the killing of Mr. George Floyd, whether it be on the news or social media or in conversations. But what does it really mean? One of the ways that I recommend thinking about it is that systemic racism is comprised of structural, institutional, and individual racism, and that all of them have to be addressed if we are going to mitigate the impact of racism, if we're going to dismantle racism in our country. We can't just focus on one. They all need to be addressed. So the first one is structural racism. 
And this includes laws, policies, practices, and even the physical structures that we live in. Institutional has to do with institutions and organizational practice. So when I say institution, I mean like the institution of healthcare, education, law enforcement, housing, food, employment, all of those things are big institutions. And then the organizations are more like the places where you work. For example, I would say I work in healthcare and education and the organization I work for is University of California Davis, right? So I wanna look at what institutional practices are happening within my institutions, healthcare and education and organization UC Davis. And then individual racism is what people tend to think of when they think of racism. Um, and so this really has to do with human interactions. And so as the conversation has been wonderfully moving forward, not quickly enough in my view, but at least it's moving forward, I've heard people say, let's not talk about microaggressions or individual racism. That's a distraction from structural racism. And I would like to point out that that is a huge fallacy. We have to address all of them. One is not distracting from the other. They're all part of an overall problem that, that creates systemic racism. So yes, we need to look at the laws, the structures, and the policies. Um, we also need to look at human interactions and we need to know the degree to which institutions are complicit in maintaining racial disparities. So I want to give you some examples of what I mean by structural inequities. There are a lot of examples, but this is one that I've been working on lately. So cost of living. Let's just think about the cost of living. Um, I, when I introduced myself, I let you know that I'm from Sacramento, California. California has one of the highest costs of living in the United States. Um, for a one-bedroom fair market apartment, it costs a little over $1,700 a month. Um, our minimum wage is $15.50 an hour. So if you work minimum wage, it would take you approximately 88 hours of a week of work to afford an average one bedroom apartment in the state of California. If you um, are all fancy because you have four kids and you want a two bedroom apartment, it's gonna cost you even more to afford that. So I, I hear you, all of you from Texas or all of you thinking of moving to Texas, um, cost of living is much cheaper. If you look at a one bedroom fair market apartment in the state of Texas, it's nearly $700 a month cheaper, right? So yeah, it would make sense. The cost of living is less, but the minimum wage is also different in the state of Texas, $7.25 per hour, meaning that if you make minimum wage and you wanna live in a one bedroom apartment, you would need to work 116 hours per week to afford that. So both of those are structural issues. People do not really get a say in how much they wanna pay for a mortgage or for a rental, nor do people have as individuals a big say in what the minimum wage is. You're paid what you're paid, right? So these are considered structural problems, which we could address for resources to be more equitably distributed. So another thing is the poverty rate and who bears the burden of poverty? Who are the people that are least likely to be able to afford housing. So if you look at the overall poverty rate as of 2022, we're combining all demographic groups together, it's about 11.5%. If you look at the range, who has the lowest poverty rate and who has the nearly the highest, you can see whites, also Asians have 8.6% poverty rate. Um, black communities, 17.1% poverty rate. So you can see that it, in that difference, who is most likely to have housing insecurity, experience homelessness, and lose that 17.5 years of uh, life expectancy that we were talking about. These are structural issues. So going back to that slide, 
Um, why is it that um, black and brown people are more likely to experience homelessness? It's a structural issue that we need to solve in our country to improve health outcomes. So an example of institutional racism, I want to bring to your attention, this is a newspaper article that came out, I've highlighted it, October 21st, 2021. So this is not 1921. This is just a couple of years ago. And the headline was that the NFL agrees to end race-based brain testing in a billion dollar settlement. And what you know the header was is that the league had agreed in June am amid the uproar to halt the use of race norming, which assumes black players start with lower cognitive function. That makes it harder to show that they suffer from a mental deficit linked with their playing days. So let's look at this from both an institutional and an organizational perspective. From the institutional perspective, it is healthcare that has engaged in the practice of race norming um, healthcare tests, which, you know, as a mixed race person, I'm like, please tell me, are you going to use the white person or the black person race norming for me? And I need you to justify that by percentages. And I have no idea what my percentages are, right? I mean, it, it, it makes very, very little sense. Yet we have continued to use these over time. So this particular one uh, has to do with where the baseline is for different individuals. So the baseline of this cognitive test places black folks lower than white folks, meaning just as, as a basis, black people are uh, score lower cognitively just in general. So what this means for football players is that if you've been hit in the head repeatedly over the course of your career as a football player, you we know that there can be brain damage and with brain damage, there are um, cognitive deficits. So if you're a white player, they would give you a test and say, wow, you know, yours is fairly low. We're so sorry for all of the injury that you've gotten here, have a payout. If you're a black player who sustained multiple injuries to the brain and you take that test, they're gonna say, you know what? You were probably already that way. So you are not eligible for um, the, the health benefits related to that, right? So that is hugely problematic. Um, that the NFL has engaged in that practice is an organizational issue. Let's talk about another example of race norming that has been in um, the news lately, particularly in healthcare. Um, so this is an article from March 2021, and this is really having to do with race normed glomerular filtration rates, which is one of the primary diagnostic methods for detecting kidney disease, right? So there was a different norm for Black folks than white folks with the assumption that because, and this is the assumption, that because Black people have more muscle mass, they are going to have different protein levels, which are going to Im impact their, um, their kidney function tests. So again, in, in a world where we know that race is a social construct, in a world where we know that so many of uh, the individuals that are coming in and out of healthcare are mixed race, this is really an inaccurate proxy for ancestry. And there have been problems with it. Um, so this is the National Kidney Foundation who is acknowledging that race is a social, not a biological construct and that leaders of this group asserted that race modifiers should not be included in equations used to estimate kidney function. So again, one of the outcomes of this was that black people were not eligible for kidney treatments and kidney transplants because what was considered normal for them was different than what was considered normal for white folks, such that they weren't eligible for treatments. So again, why do we have these big giant health disparities based on race? It's because of institutional and organizational practices such as these. I know at my health system, we are no longer using race normed GFRs and um, hopefully there are more organizations that are moving away from that as well. So let's talk about, we've talked about structural, we've talked about institutional. Now let's talk about individual inequities. And one of the examples I wanna use 
is um, an analogy from Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. She wrote the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And in an interview that she was in, um, she used the analogy of the smog of racism. And this is what she said, books, computer games, the web, television, there are so many places that we can be exposed to stereotypes, that we can be exposed to distorted information. And there's a whole universe of information that we're not getting. Think about these stereotypes, these omissions, these distortions as a kind of environment that surrounds us like smog in the air. We don't breathe it because we like it. We don't breathe it because we think it's good for us. We breathe it because it's the only air that's available. So my question for you is to think about where are we getting this information? And I would say we're getting it from everywhere. If you have watched television, if you have watched movies, I mean, just think about the superhero franchise. Who are the, the people that are um, depicted as um, Superman and Spider-Man and Batman and Wonder Woman? They're all white people, right? Um, we in the Black community were overwhelmed with happiness when we got Chadwick Boseman representing the Black Panther. This was another strong superhero that reflected a demographic that had otherwise been overlooked. And we could argue that there are many demographics that are being overlooked. But one of the things that happens is that when we see heroes depicted as white people over and over, we're taking in stereotypes about them. When we see stereotypes about black and brown people as being the sidekick or the criminal or the expendable character, we're taking that in as a stereotype. And the argument is that when you're taking in those stereotypes, they become part of your unconscious and that those things can be accessed during times like clinical decision-making. So when you're engaged in prioritizing a patient, yet you have these scripts in your head about people, that might influence who you're prioritizing in that very moment. There are other examples around gender that we can think of. Um, one of the examples is that if you've ever gone to a grocery store and you've waited in line at the, at the counter, if you look to the right, you'll probably see candy. If you look to the left, you're likely to see covers of magazines. And on the cover of magazines are what our society puts forth as images of beauty, which tend to be primarily white, young, and thin, right? And again, it's not like we go to the grocery store saying, hey, I want to learn about what beauty is. Rather, we're taking it in passively. So if you start to compile all of the things that we've taken in, that can end up in something that we call the smog of racism. And here's another analogy that I'll share with you. Um, I am very open about the fact that when I was a young person, I was engaged in civil disobedience and was arrested from time to time. And one of the issues that was and is very important to me is the environment and climate change. And so I no longer do civil disobedience like that. Um, I am approaching issues more from the educational and policy level, but I still feel like addressing the environment and climate change are very important to me. And because of that, I have decided that smog is a terrible thing. And I have simply decided that I'm not gonna breathe in smog anymore because breathing smog does not align with my value system I don't breathe it in anymore. And I'm hoping that when I say that, that sounds ridiculous to you, right? I, I live in the city of Sacramento. I travel to places like the California Central Valley and Los Angeles. How is it possible for me to not breathe in smog, right? And so I would like to say that for those of you that say I have no bias, um, there's not a racist bone in my body, I don't have any unconscious bias, my question to you is, how are you able to do that? Just like, how am I able to not breathe in environmental smog? How are you able to not breathe in the smog of racism? And the answer to that is, you're not. It's in there somewhere, whether you're aware of it or not. The nice thing about the smog of racism is that we can 
rewire our brains so that we are defaulting not to those scripts that we've learned, but rather positive scripts about people, right? We want our default to be health equity. So what does it mean to be anti-racist? Ibram Kindi defined anti-racism as an active state where individuals and or organizations effectively identify racist policies, practices, processes, behaviors, or ideas or actions and purposefully dismantle them. And so I bolded that piece about active state. Yes, maybe it's part of your value system to be anti-racist, but simply sitting in that value system is not going to be enough for us to change the um, racially disparate outcomes that we see in healthcare and in our country. Another author of the book, Silent Racism, stated that anti-racism refers to taking a committed stand against racism, a stand that translates into action and that interrupts racism in all of its forms, whether personal or institutional, blatant or routine, intended or unintended. She says anti-racism is active by definition the opposite of passivity, which colludes with racism. If one claims to be anti-racist, but takes no action against racism, the claim is false. Okay, I have a, a couple more scholarly quotes for you. Um, this is one from my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ruth Shim. This is the book that the quote comes from. She says that we need to move from a culture of witnessing the negative impact of the social environment on mental health and thinking someone should do something about this to I should do something about this to I can do something about this. She says through community involvement to shift social norms and through engagement with legislative process to improve public policy, we can experience a sense of community focused agency promote a more equal distribution of opportunity and begin to heal an unfair and unwell society. I would like to share a quote from Nicole Hannah Jones. She is the author of the 1619 series. And she said, when we talk about systemic inequality, it kind of alleviates us from acting. She said, we can kind of throw our hands up and say, well, it's too big. It was created a long time ago. There's nothing I can personally do, but that's not true. It was created intentionally, which means it can be intentionally undone. The question is, are we willing to put the same amount of effort into undoing inequality as we did into creating it? And my final quote for you is from um, David R. Williams, who wrote the foreword to Daniel Dawes books. This is, all of these are exceptional books. I highly recommend that you, if you haven't read them, that you take a peek at them. Um, in the foreword, David Williams says, the health equity movement is just that, a movement of people committed to advancing health equity for all communities. It requires the participation and unwavering commitment of all of us working to, to together to address the determinants of health and advocating for improvement, improving the quality of life for those who have been historically ignored and excluded from opportunities afforded to other privileged groups. So I am going to stop there for a moment. I am looking, oh my gosh. I decided to look and see if there was anything in the chat box and there are numerous messages. I think a lot of them are introductions. Um, are there questions or comments at this point? What I'd like to do is move into a case scenario, which is actually something that is from an interview that I did with students regarding microaggressions, but I wanna make sure before we move into that session that we're clear about the concepts that I brought up in this talk. Let's see. Yes, we all have unconscious biases. Thank you that that's just part of being human. It doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad human. It means that you're a human. All right, 
Yes, these slides will be shared. Lovely, I see somebody is working with my partner, Ruth Shim. All right, all that sounds great. Okay, here's a question. How can we incentivize um, how can we incentivize and or deceptive current practices to create equity? Ah, yes. Okay, so Danielle, wait, I think that you're, uh, you know, obviously I can't answer and probably nobody can answer that particular question, but that is one of the questions that needs to be fundamentally addressed. How are healthcare providers paid in general. If you're looking at a healthcare system, if we're going to look at the institution, one of the institutional issues is how we've designed our healthcare system. So the fee for service, we've talked a lot about um, you know, the value-based purchasing piece of healthcare and that so many healthcare providers are limited to volume. They need to see 23, 30 patients within a day, which translates to eight minute visits. How do you build a trusting relationship with your patients when you literally don't have the time to engage with them, right? So that would be something that we need to address at the structural level. We also know that when people do not have access to uh, healthcare via inability to pay or ability to actually get there or what they're getting to is a fractured healthcare system, that that's gonna result in health disparities and that those health disparities are likely going to impact some groups more than others. For example, people who are poor, people of color, people who live in rural areas and things like that. So I think that what you've done is nailed one of the really important questions that we need to answer. Um, Debbie Smith, thank you. So just as important as addressing the structural issues such as how we pay for health care is reflecting about the kind of care that we as individuals are providing. And I know that everyone on this webinar today um, values health equity and is very much interested in practicing with anti-racism. The problem is that no matter what your intent is, like everyone, we've taken in the smog of racism. And so I would argue that for the majority of the time, it's very likely that you're practicing up to your, sta your uh, value standards. But what happens in those moments when you are exhausted, when you are experiencing moral distress, when you're multitasking, um, distracted, you know, any of those sorts of things, that's going to put more cognitive load on your prefrontal cortex. And your prefrontal cortex is where you're making those clinical decisions, those priorities, all of that. And you'll revert back to your automatic system. And that's where we look for patterns. Patterns and stereotypes are very similar things. So it's very likely that that at some point in your day, you have made decisions that are based on some unconscious bias that you have. And my argument is that that's gonna happen when you're tired. So how do we spend the time being mindful and aware of and really understanding what those biases are? What are our triggers? I know what mine are. I know what some of mine are. And I also know as a former ICU and ER nurse, that probably between hours eight and 14 of my shift is when I would be more likely to be accessing unconscious bias, right? And that, again, somebody said, unconscious bias is a human thing. That's part of being human. So can we be aware of it? We also know that in academics and healthcare, we tend to get a little egotistical about our ability to stay in our objective and rational minds. And we think that we're making objective decisions when we're really not. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring up a case scenario. And again, I was telling you that this comes from, let me get the share screen up again. This comes from a body of work that I did around microaggressions where I talked with nursing students and medical students from around the country and asked them for examples 
of microaggressions. This one is a little bit long. There are multiple layers to it, but I'm hoping that we can go through it and then break out into groups. And I want you to identify what are the what are the problems here? What are the microaggressions? Um, what is potentially um, a problem from a racist standpoint? And then I really want you to focus on what schools of nursing should be doing about this. So a student says, I was doing my pedi pediatric rotation and had a newborn from a Hispanic family who was not doing well. We have this thing called molara, the front fontanelle, the soft part of the head. If we, be we believe if you press on it or if you shake the baby too much, it's super taboo for us to touch it. It's part of the nursing physical assessment to pal palpate the fontanelle. I went in with my preceptor and she did it. I was paying attention to the family because I knew what that meant for us. Since the baby was already not in the best health, their facial expression was one of almost terror like, why are you touching my baby there? But they didn't say anything. So when my preceptor said, now you do it, I said, you know, actually, I think that's okay. I'll do the other things and I can explain to you about it after. I did the assessment and when we walked out, I tried to explain to her how taboo it was um, and that she had already done it. I was trying to have a patient-centered approach to my care and I got slammed for it. She was actually very upset with me that I disobeyed her in front of the patient's family. And from that point on, it was just a horrendous experience with her. I almost failed the rotation. So that's sort of piece one. That's the student's experience with her preceptor. So she ended up talking with her department head. And when I went to talk to them, they were already aware because the preceptor had called and said, I wasn't doing as I was told. And I was told to suck it up. At our school of nursing, if you fail the class, you fail the year, you repeat. There is no remediation for any clinical or any class that we do. The pressure is immense to pass. What ends up happening is that we get these preceptors who are very insensitive to cultural cultural diversity. When we speak out, I'm not the only student who's experienced this, we tell each other. The students of color at the School of Nursing warn each other about certain preceptors saying certain things. We have it as a culture within our school that we warn each other because every year one minority student of the entering class fails out. And it's usually because of a preceptor and it's usually because of the same preceptor all of the time. So if you could pull out is there institutional racism happening? Is there individual racism happening? Identify those. And then what are some things that can be happening at the level of the School of Nursing and the level of the faculty member?